I note that I have the uh, church uh, in, in my background, the sanctuary with the uh, Advent and Christ candle all lit. This is the, uh, the setting for Christmas Eve. And I'm leaving it up for today because this Wednesday is Epiphany. And the end of the 12 days of Christmas, the actual Christmas season, is this Tuesday. So we're still in the season of Christmas. And uh, I thought it was appropriate to, to keep this up for this Sunday. And maybe some of you uh, weren't with us on Christmas Eve. Um, Sunday school is on break today. And uh, this may be uh, timely uh, because for the first time I have uh, an adult content uh, warning for the sermon. Uh, we're talking about our bodies and uh, the topic of sexuality comes up. So just to put you on notice in case you, uh, uh, you might have young children, uh, you, you <laughs> Just a little, it's, it's nothing uh, prurient or anything like that, of course, but the topic uh, of uh, sexuality does come up, just to put you on notice. Are there any other announcements for us today? I will have pictures to share uh, of uh, Gloria's uh, Aloha drive-by last Sunday afternoon. That went uh, really well as an event. And uh, I also have uh, um, a song that uh, Gloria and her uh, siblings uh, recorded from the uh, CD that uh, we played from uh, uh, before a couple months ago. Another song that fits in very well with Epiphany, the wonderful grace of Jesus. So, let us get underway with our call to worship, and doing that for us will be Amy and Andrew. Eternal God, today is a day of new beginnings. On the first day of the week, you began your work of creating life out of nothing. On the first day of the week, you raised Jesus and began the work of creating new life from death. On the first day of the week, you sent your Holy Spirit and began your work of creating new life in your church. Help us to live today as people who have begun again. To live every day with the new life which comes to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let me... Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus, Reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace, the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, the salvation grace for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus 
reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace, the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, the stars and all sufficient grace for me, for me, and me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of a new year. Many folks were glad to see the end of the last year. It was a bad year for all too many. But there were also some good things that happened. Let us not forget them, nor take them for granted. Health workers rose up to the challenge of overflowing hospitals. Scientists developed multiple vaccines in record time. Communities and neighborhoods banded together when government failed. Our nation voted for a change of course. We have a ways to go, we know. Inauguration day is still a few weeks away. It will be longer before vaccines have reached most of our own country and even longer for so much of the rest of the world. It will be a long time before many jobs return. But a new year has begun. Help us to keep our guard up against infection. Help our teachers and all who are students to do as well as they can safely, safely from our preschool to our collegians. Help all of us deal with our own limits and frustrations and longings. This season of social distancing has gone on far longer than any of us had hoped. And many people on the mainland, but also here, seem to have thrown all caution to the wind, even as their own communities, hospitals overflow and deaths continue. May our nation, our state, our island community be graced with a blanket of peace. May we be able as a society to step back from caustic commentary and false witness May our Congress conduct its business this week with integrity. May the elections in the state of Georgia be conducted smoothly and fairly. May we be a nation drawn to the truth and wise enough to turn from deceit in all its forms. We have become a nation that worships the false God of absolute power, regardless of truth, compassion, fairness, or even common sense. We are on a dangerous path. Guide us, O oh God, in the footsteps of your Son, the light of the world. We lift up our prayers for our preschool beginning a new term this week and for our church as we continue our pandemic wilderness journey. We give thanks for the safe return of Scott Craven from Arizona and his continuing recovery from the virus. And we lift up all those who are ill with COVID or with any other malady, as well as those who continue to recover from surgery, injury, and loss. We lift up our prayers to you, spoken and unspoken, along with the prayer that Jesus gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John. The scripture is 
John 1, verses 10 through 18. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God as in, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. May God bless the reading of his word. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John is the only gospel writer who calls Jesus the word or logos. Logos is familiar to all of us, of course, because of a local bookstore we all know and love. And it's a common word in the New Testament. But only here and in the first verse of the Gospel of John is it personified as Jesus. Logos is a very rich word with a long and broad history of use. It originally meant something like to gather, which led to, to reason. And this was centuries before Christ. By the time of Jesus, a Jewish philosopher in Egypt by the name of Philo was writing about the Logos as flowing from God and being the mechanism through which God created the universe. So does this mean that Logos theology is Greek? Was it kind of added on? Not really. Logos is a straightforward translation of the Hebrew word davar, which means word, as in the word of the Lord came to Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or any number of other Old Testament figures. And in Hebrew thought, there is already an association of word and wisdom and God speaking creation into being. So pretty much all the elements we can identify in John's use of the term for Jesus, divinity, creativity, wisdom, being with God in the beginning, are there already in Jewish thought. It's just that here in John's gospel, the Jewish world meets the broader world of Greek culture. The gospel was written in Greek. So what does it mean for us? The word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. Jesus, the word who was God, who was with God in the beginning and through whom all things came into being, now entered the world of his creation as a creature of human flesh. He became one of us. He made his dwelling among us. He pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us as God tabernacled with his people in the wilderness. What Matthew, Mark, and Luke only suggest and set the stage for, John tells us straight, right away, and in poetic form. Many scholars believe that this first section of John's gospel was based on an early Christian hymn. I want to dwell on just one aspect of this verse, maybe the one aspect we tend to ignore the most. That is, the word became flesh. Flesh. The word took on a human body. On the one hand, that's what incarnation means. Carnus, Latin meaning flesh or meat, like in chili con carne, chili with meat. But on the other hand, there's also the problem. Carnus as in carnal, as in sexual. 
we find it so easy to get into trouble in this arena, we largely stay out of it. Many years ago, I went hiking with a bunch of pastor friends and spouses on Kauai. We were on the North Shore at the trailhead to the Kalalau Trail. We were about to hike to Hanakapiai Beach, three miles in, when some hikers emerged from the trailhead, male and female, dressed only in backpacks and hiking shoes. This was when hiking nude along this particular trail was very common, and they were always tourists. We called them hippies. I never saw a local person hiking in the buff. One of the pastors I was with, an older man, looked at the hikers and shook his head. The human body is so ugly, he said. To which a younger pastor's wife immediately reacted, no, it isn't. It's a cliche that Christians have an issue with sexuality, with the body. Some used to think, and maybe still do, that the original sin of Adam and Eve was sex, which is pretty funny when you consider that God commanded them to be fruitful and to multiply. What were they going to do? Clone themselves? But we do have issues with our bodies and not just over sexuality. The internet and social media have saturated our lives even more with images. And our young people and many others are all the more vulnerable now to hold their own appearances to unhealthy standards. One of my seminary friends, a very attractive, lovely young woman confessed to us that growing up, she had suffered from bulimia, the compulsion to gorge and then to throw up repeatedly for fear of gaining weight long before smartphones and the internet. We often have such a hard time accepting our bodies and our creaturely existence. We find it easy to be dissatisfied with our appearance. We feel oddly at odds with our flesh. Many have come to believe that our bodies are mere encumbrances, necessary but temporary evils to tolerate, but to one day be freed from. Francis of Assisi famously referred to his body as brother ass, a saint's way of dealing with his body's temptations and demands. And most ideas of heaven or the life hereafter are based on a spirit versus body contrast. Many Christians, myself included, came to the conclusion that bodies are bad or at least inferior, while spirit, some bodiless form of existence, is better, superior, and what we are all headed toward. But here's the thing. Thinking of spirit as superior to body is not biblical thinking. It comes from Greek philosophy. The church certainly went this way in the centuries after Christ, at least the Roman church did, not so much the Orthodox. But we are in the lineage of the Roman West, and so we have inherited this long-standing prejudice that bodies are bad, spirit is good. And perhaps because of this, we haven't given anywhere as much thought to the incarnation of Jesus as we have to the death of Jesus. Is it because incarnation necessarily brings up the body and all that it represents? But the word did become flesh, not just to die for us and then return to a spirit-only form of existence. I suspect that many Christians assume that when the word became flesh, it was like the pure and spiritual Christ took a dive into the cesspool of human flesh so that he could die and rise and save us. But once he had done this, Christ ascended, stripped off his body, and rejoined the Godhead in pure spirit, spiritual form. Like Jesus would have shuddered, you know, and said, boy, am I glad to be rid of that filthy thing. After all, isn't the flesh a bad thing in the Bible? In some places, it is, like in Paul, where the flesh usually means the self in rebellion against God. But note that even in this sense of the flesh being bad, what is bad is the will that rejects and rebels against the good, not the body as such. In other places, like here in John, the flesh is a neutral term. Even more in John 6, Jesus says, 
he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Certainly here, flesh is not bad. In biblical thought, the body, mind, spirit, and will comprise a unity, make up our personhood. And that unity is preserved in the age to come, the kingdom of God or heaven, however you choose to, to, to think of it. We receive resurrection bodies. One's body as the flesh is not bad. It's a part of who we are, created in the image of God. And that is something God called very good. What we do with our bodies can be bad, but that potential does not erase the innate goodness of our bodies. I don't know about you, but it has taken me a long time to get past the misguided view of the body is bad, the spirit is good, to realize that our bodies are God's gifts to us. For most of my life, I have felt like St. Francis with a body like Brother Ass. But undergoing prostate surgery a few years ago changed my attitude. The healing process I went through gave me a new appreciation for my body through its ability to heal from injury. And even though at 60, I was already over the hill physically, I came to appreciate my body more than I think I ever had before. Your body is a gift, not a curse. When the word became flesh, the word was not polluted or profaned. Just as when Jesus touched the leper, instead of Jesus becoming unclean, the leper was cleansed. So also when the word became flesh, our flesh was consecrated. Our flesh was again declared very good as part of our humanity in the image of God. This may not be the message an evangelical upbringing gave us, but it is an understanding shared by many in other parts of the church. And I think it is a healthy and better understanding than many of us may have received. The church fairly quickly determined that if salvation is to be true for us in Christ, then Christ must have assumed our humanity fully. The conviction was what he has not assumed, he cannot save. This was to guard against an early heresy that claimed that Jesus only appeared to be human while he was actually spiritual in nature. The church rejected this body bad, spirit good idea, and so should we. Jesus came to be one with us, not only in the sense of being for us as our savior, but also in being a human, really, knowing what it is like with all its pains, pleasures, and peculiarities, never choosing to sin, but experiencing temptation to sin. The eternal word became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus truly was and continues to be one of us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, you made us in your image and likeness. Adam and Eve broke that image but Jesus took on our humanity and made it new. And now we live in Christ in the promise of our own renewal, long with all creation. As this new year begins, O oh God, may we renew our trust in you and live each day in the light of the living word who became flesh, our flesh, for our sake. Amen. And now, I would like to share some pictures before our communion uh, celebration. Uh, I have some pictures of Gloria's drive-by aloha. If I can get my pictures up. Oh, isn't technology so much fun? Here we go. Share. Share screen. I want to thank uh, everybody who
particularly Susan and Jean, who worked so hard to make this happen. Okay. Here are Al and Gloria. And uh, we were set up in the lawn, as you can see, in front of the big doors. This is the thing with uh, Zoom. Oh, let me try this again. No. I just, I can't do full frame, sorry, full screen. So people began rolling up uh, at one o'clock. At first we were thinking, okay, we gotta keep everybody in their cars. Uh, that didn't last long. Some people got out of their cars to present lays. Other people stayed in their cars. Some people brought their pets. Some people brought their pets and gave gifts that were for Al and Gloria's new pet, Jack. Like a uh, leash for Jack. After they found out that Jack chewed through four leashes in two weeks. So I think uh, Jack got at least a couple more leashes. And here are more people not just driving by, but parking. And there were air hugs given and received. This was uh, John, John Gu. Um, uh, John left back for the mainland this past week. So it was great that he was able to be here for this. And this is uh, Hiroko Ijima. Uh, from our Nihongo, she gave uh, Gloria this beautiful haku. And Samuel Wakai and his mom drove up. Uh, and this was the setting. Our custodian, uh, Ryan Higa, got up early and actually you may recall that it rained early that morning and there was actually water on the lawn. Uh, Ryan pumped it out for us uh, early in the morning. Jimmy and Amanda Sato with their mom. And some people brought <laughs> posters for Gloria. And here are the Ferezas with Gloria. And the Rose Among Thorns. And that's it. So thank you everybody for taking part. Uh, it went really well. And now if I'll give you a minute to uh, prepare your communion elements, and then we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. the first communion of the new year. Community of saints, those who know that we are God's beloved, we are invited to gather at our virtual table of love and freedom, to be offered the bread of heaven and living water gushing up to eternal life. God calls us as we are, from wherever we are, to come and be together with Christ, who abides, who tabernacles with us. Blessed are those, Jesus said, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so let us come to the table, expectant, grateful, and open to tasting the rich blessings of heaven offered 
in unexpected places and people and experiences. In this meal, we remember the life, death, and resurrection of the one who still takes on flesh among us today. After all, that is why we are called the body of Christ. On the night he would be arrested, Jesus gathered his friends and companions, and in the midst of a tense and dangerous time, they found each other at table, remembering the Exodus story, the Passover. And as they did so, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and shared it with his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he also took the cup, gave thanks to God, and shared it with his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, breath of God, renewer of life. Settle on these gifts and on all who gather, that we might be transformed in our remembrance of your radical love, your eternal embrace, and your grace that makes all things new. May this meal be for us, bread for our journey, and nourishment for our participation in your kingdom coming ways. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Let us partake and share. The blood of Christ shed for you, the gifts of God for the people of God. Partake and share. Let us pray together. God, by the bread of heaven and the cup of life, you make us one body. Bind us together by your spirit that we might live into your hopes for us, a community centered in Christ and rich in compassion, commitment, courage, and care. May it be so in this new year and every day. For Christ's sake and in his name we pray. Amen. And let us together affirm what we believe, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ is coming again. And now in this new year, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the spirit attend you every day, wherever you go, go in peace. And now please uh, unmute and feel free to greet one another and pass the peace of Christ.